Hey guys from the Thoughtful Gardener. Well, I asked you and you responded and I am sincerely grateful for that. We are trying to get an idea of what you're dealing with in the garden and certainly here in the Thoughtful Garden, we have our own set of issues. Not unusual whatsoever to have pests that we deal with. Each year, as you know, is different and so certainly here I'm having some of the same challenges you are. So let's talk about what we can do to prevent those pests from causing us too many headaches. The first thing that you guys let me know you were dealing with is insect issues. Whether it was Japanese beetles, white flies, aphids, stink bugs or squash bugs, grasshoppers or flea beetles, they all seem to be causing you lots of headaches. And certainly that's true in my garden too. Uh, this year the flea beetles weren't so bad but last year they were a nightmare so i am with you flea beetle fighters it's really really frustrating but one of the things that i have learned is that you definitely want to plant companion plants a lot of times you can confuse insects from causing damage to your vegetables by creating a scent that either repels the insect or invites in good guys that might then feast on those insects and one of my favorite books that I recommend you read and keep in your library as a gardener is called The Plant Partners. It's by Jessica Walliser. This book is really fantastic because it gives you companion plants that you can consider to put in the garden. And what I have found in my own garden is that alyssum is definitely a plant partner you want to consider for your vegetable garden. Not only is it absolutely gorgeous, but it invites in those good guys it has a very pleasant honey-like smell and it reseeds every year. So this is one that I have found that the flea beetles really don't care for. So I definitely recommend getting some seeds. You can start them right in the garden or you can start them early if you want. But I find that this one has been extremely prolific to reseed and it's just super pretty. It provides that green mulch too that you might be looking for to keep your soil cool which will also help retain moisture. So definitely, if you're dealing with some of these insects, let's try companion planting as one solution. Now, Japanese beetles, did you know that they do not like garlic? This is also true if you're a rose lover. They seem to love to feast on my roses in particular. So I typically plant garlic. Now that may sound insane to you, but no one's gonna really see it. So I would definitely give it a try. They don't like the alliums. Another option might be our alliums itself. And this is the right time of year to put those in the ground. I personally like Van England. I order tons of different types of bulbs, but my alliums come back year after year. And wouldn't you know it, they actually look really attractive with roses. So that might be another option for you if they are snacking on your beautiful petals. Uh, also, too, you can use a product called BT. Now, this is a natural soil bacteria that actually keeps away the larvae of the beetle. And you can have it applied or you can apply it yourself to your yard. But keep in mind that this kills caterpillars. And it also is used in those dunks that you might see for mosquitoes. It's exceptionally effective at keeping away larvae. So you really have to really put it down one time on your lawn and you're not going to have caterpillars again. Again, if you are a pollinator gardener, this might be an issue for you. So be very, very cautious about what you're doing. We always want to use a, a technique called integrated pest management or IPM for short, which means you do the least amount of harm possible. But if you are really struggling with the Japanese beetles, that could be an option. Otherwise, make it pretty and plant yourselves some alliums or garlic. White flies are super annoying for me, and I find the issue I deal with is bringing plants in in the winter. Anyone else? Just me? Okay, well, what I have found is that if bringing your plants in, you need to do a little bit of pest management prior to bringing them in, or else white flies can get all over everything. So I tend to give my plants a little bit of a shower with some uh, soap that's not toxic, like Castile soap and water. And you put a tablespoon of that in about a, a pint of water and then you can spray down your plant or you can just dunk your plant in something like a bucket if it's small enough. Let it sit in there for 15 minutes or so. It'll kill any kind of pests that are in the soil. 
and it gets your uh, plant good and saturated. I have not found that the Castile soap has any detrimental effects on any of my plants. So um, that has been something that has worked for me for white flies. White flies also can be repelled with companion plants. So I'm gonna refer you back to Jessica's book. I don't wanna give away all her spoilers here. You need this book, Ask Santa. Ask your friends, somebody ought to buy this book. You should buy it for yourself. I have this one. It's one that I constantly refer to when I'm working in my own garden and in clients' gardens so we can keep away challenges that we know we might face. All right, uh, so stink bugs and squash bugs. Well, squash bugs a lot of times has to do with crop rotation, but I hear about squash bugs from my mom because she gardens in a community garden. And the problem has been is that because people keep putting in uh, plants in the same area year after year, then they get into her bed. So she actually keeps her squash at her house in a grow box because she's trying to keep it away from other people's gardens. Now, keep in mind, squash bugs a lot of times will bore into the actual plant itself, but you, squash has a tendency to uh, allow itself to pop up in other places. So sometimes you can cut off the diseased plant and keep going. But I know that this is a really pervasive thing in the soil. So you wanna be very, very conscientious about maybe crop rotation. Maybe we don't put squash in that bed next year uh, to allow those things to die down because it can be extremely devastating for your plant. Stink bugs. I don't know that I have a great solution for stink bugs because guess what? Native stink bugs are actually part of the ecosystem and there are things that will eat the stink bugs. I used to kill them because I used to hate to see my caterpillars hanging from their mouths that really, really, really bothered me. But understand that if you start messing with the ecosystem, they will start eating things that they otherwise shouldn't, you wouldn't want them to eat. This is one of the things I hear a lot when it comes to aphids on milkweed. There's all these people trying to get them the aphids off. But understand that even though it's a non-native pest, it is part of the ecosystem. And if you remove every non-native pest off something like your milkweed, you might be actually causing your caterpillars to get eaten. Because guess what? The good guys, like our ladybugs who love to eat them, and will eat your caterpillars if they're desperate for food. So what we want to do is try to invite as many good guys into the ecosystem as possible. The way you can do that is by companion planting with native wildflowers or native plants. If you've been to any of my talks in person or in Zoom, you hear me talk about this concept because it's something I learned as a gardener as a little girl because my grandfather was also a beekeeper. Now, I know that honeybees are native since before the Ice Age. Yes, guess what, folks? They were native before the Ice Age. Then they were imported after the Ice Age because they died out and the Europeans brought them here. According to Professor Patch, so don't debate me on that one, debate him. The point being is, is that when we invite in our pollinators, you can actually create a system where you don't need to do a lot of management when it comes to insects. Because the good guys, your birds, bats, bees, and other insects that will help manage some of these issues, like our ladybug we just talked about, will move in. So I love the idea of the pollinator hedgerow. I have this in my orchard. So I have apple trees, peach trees, cherry trees, and pear trees in my tiny orchard. And what I have done is planted all different types of wildflowers, native flowers, and ground covers. And these are things that our insects like. Gives them places to hide. It provides a green mulch and actually acts as, in some, some cases, an activator, meaning that it goes deep down in the soil and then actually brings the nutrients up to the trees. This is how I avoid using pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, and fertilizers. Yep, you heard it here, folks. I don't fertilize my vegetable garden or my fruit trees with anything other than natural mulches. And the reason that I do that uh, is to protect our insects. We've actually discovered recently that putting these inputs in affects our pollinators' behavior. It can affect the way they fly, it can affect the way they pollinate your fruits and vegetables. It's really important to get very natural. Grow your own. I grow a lot of borage. That's a really easy one to grow. 
a, a, a dynamic soil accumulator, which means long tap roots that then come up and feed those plants, beautiful blue flowers that you can eat and beautiful color that the bees absolutely love. So that might be why you wanna think about incorporating into your garden if you're concerned about using chemicals. In my case, I have a genetically compromised pet, so chemicals are off limits in the thoughtful garden. Plus, I don't wanna do anything that will hurt my pollinators. But what can you do uh, to help as well feed uh, your plants from a standpoint of green mulches? Well, one that you could do is to plant comfrey. Now I do a chop and drop technique where I chop the comfrey up this time of year, put it down on the soil, it's feeding the soil and it's giving the soil lots of nutrients. Also too, you can take it and I usually fill up a bucket um, sometime in the season, cover it with water, and then it's an anaerobic bacteria accumulates. It's smelly folks. I have mine outside my garage because it's really smelly, but it's in a place that nobody else can see it. And then you dilute that with water the next year and you can feed your plants. What I also like to do is no dig technique. And then this time of year, I'm putting six inches of compost on my beds and letting that compost down. I found that's been a really, really great way of dealing with um, potentially preventing some of the challenges you might normally see in a normal vegetable garden. Um, so if you're interested in that, we do have videos on the no dig technique. Uh, Charles Downing is my hero. I love him. I encourage you to watch his YouTube channel too, but he has been teaching this technique that results in more yield as well as a bigger harvest. He does a traditional till versus no-till every year and the no-till always is equivalent and or better. That's been my experience too, especially if you don't want to spend too much time in the garden. I think not having good soil is one of the reasons why you have insects. If you have a healthy plant, typically you won't have insects attack it. However, there are some things that will attack healthy plants and that actually might be a good thing. Look, if no one is eating your garden, you don't have a healthy garden. So one of the ones I really dealt with this past year to my chagrin was I had slugs. Really not had issues with slugs any other year. And it's really kind of strange because our spring was incredibly dry. But then we got a deluge of rain and from that point on there were just slugs all over my greens especially now in my case i hand picked them off that may sound really disgusting to you you can always wear a glove to do it but then i take it to my bird feeder and they're pretty much gone within a few minutes they like to eat them so i think that um you know if you don't like them there are things you could do one is diatomaceous earth you want to use food grade diatomaceous earth. Now they sell a giant bag of this on Amazon and it'll last you forever. Just be careful when you're spreading it because it is ground up fossils. And so it's not really incredibly good for you to breathe. In fact, it probably could cause you issues. So I would definitely wear eye and a mask when you do it. But essentially what I do is I sprinkle it around where I see there are issues with slugs attacking my plants. Um, I have heard you can do other things like eggshells. I have not had luck with that. So um, diatomaceous earth has worked for me. Again, it will hurt anything like a caterpillar that would crawl over it. So just keep that in mind, but it won't hurt you and it won't hurt your pets. It's safe if you get a food grade diatomaceous earth. We had a Prosco viral this last year with different plants you could plant to keep mosquitoes away. Now. You herbalists out there were quick to point out that you can't just like plant it, not do anything with it. And that's true. In the Thoughtful Garden, we have a lavender hedge and that is on purpose because what I do is I run my hands over the hedge when I go out and then I rub it on my skin. And I have found that that works exceptionally well for keeping the mosquitoes away. Lemongrass can also work. You just gotta be really careful. Those lemongrass edges are pretty sharp but i plant lemongrass by my door because my cats really love to eat it so it's easy for me to go out and chop and uh, give it to them that's one of the grasses they like to eat um, as part of their diet so we grow lemongrass not only to repel but for kitty babies around this area another one that keeps them away cat mint mints are really hated by most everything and cat mint grows in my garden as well as catnip did you know catnip is actually more effective at tick deterrent than DEET? 
pretty crazy, right? So I think you want to definitely have both of these in your garden. Now I let mine go to seed so I can share with thoughtful gardeners like you. And of course the kitty babies love both of these. So if you've got cats, you're gonna be a fan of, of having some of these around fresh for your babies. But in addition, both of them are extremely effective at repelling insects. Ticks I didn't hear about ironically from you all, but we're number one in Lyme disease here in the state of Pennsylvania. So I am very conscientious about keeping ticks off me. Now, when I'm in the garden, I do my own self a favor. I wear tall boots, long pants, long shirts, and gloves, a hat always. And that way I can potentially keep them off of me. I found the ticks this year really weren't bad until the end of the season and then they were horrific in like the last month before we got our first frost. So what I would say about ticks is obviously you got to prepare and, and take care of yourself, but uh, wearing good clothes is, is one, one way to do it. Uh, I wear fishing gear from Columbia. Columbia, almost every video I got your clothes on. And people always comment about they love what I'm wearing because it's got pockets and so forth, but it's also water resistant and you always get wet in the garden. Um, so I think that if you're interested in um, making sure you don't get bit by a tick, I would definitely recommend all of those things. But I have found that um, both of those herbs keep them away. And there's a lot growing in my garden. I let it kind of come up everywhere because I have four garden supervisors. Yep, that's right. Four cats. All right, so what else were you guys dealing with this year? I definitely heard a lot about the mosquitoes. So if you're interested in that post, you can write mosquitoes in the comments and we will make sure to send you the actual plants that have been shown by science to grow in your garden to repel mosquitoes. Does it mean that you can just grow them and they'll stay away? No, you're gonna have to actually rub the plants on your skin or on your clothes. And I think that's a small price to pay to go natural and potentially keep away bloodsuckers. I think it's a really good thing. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, animals were worse than insects. Woo! We are number one in deer as well. Penn's woods are feel full of deer. And in my county, which is the fastest growing county in the state of Pennsylvania, we have more and more deer pressure every day because there are a lot of uh, townships around here that don't have the rules that I do in my county where you have to leave half of your lot undeveloped. That's not true of townships right next door to me. And so a lot of them are completely getting raised, put in things like hotels and warehouses and so forth. So that is putting deer to have a lot of pressure on yards. And I probably get this complaint in uh, talks uh, that I hear about from gardeners in Pennsylvania the most in terms of pests they deal with. We have an overpopulation of deer. I know that that probably breaks people's heart, but the reality is, is that if they don't have enough to eat, they go through wasting disease. Now I will tell you the deer around here look really healthy. Now, half of my lot is a tiny forest. I have a fence, so I really don't deal with them in the back. I gotta be honest. My pressure has more to do with my insane groundhog who likes to climb trees and strip them off. Over this summer, I left and I had 19 peaches on my tree. I was waiting for them to ripen up because you can't pick peaches early. If you grow peaches, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and unfortunately, I came home to zero. I'll give you one guess who ate them all. Uh, yes, it was the groundhog. The deer probably could jump my fence, but they don't um, because there's so much for them to eat in the tiny forest and unfortunately in my neighbor's shards because they don't have a fence. So um, I really don't find that they are so snacky on my plants because the majority of what I've planted here are natives. Now, does that mean they won't eat natives? Uh, no. Uh, this year I had issue definitely with bunnies chewing things here as well as at my husband's office. But what I found out is that when I left water out, they were less snacky. Uh, so uh, yeah, little bunny in the front yard mowed down all my zinnias this year, extremely frustrating, but uh, I think I got two at the end of the season, thanks. Um, and I just found that um, leaving out water pretty much reduced the amount of damage that they did to the garden. So if you're having trouble with wildlife uh, going to town in your garden, I would encourage you to consider putting down some water dishes for them, just some shallow uh, containers, 
maybe a few rocks in case a bee or something stops by to have a drink so they don't drown. But um, that prevented them from eating my vegetable garden this year because typically they've been pretty ruthless um, in my vegetable garden, especially the groundhogs. But I definitely think they were seeking water because what I noticed is I have olas. Olas are an ancient way of actually watering your vegetable garden by planting a ceramic container, in this case, an unglazed relay pot down in the soil. And then it has a little lid and you fill it up with water and it just leaches out to water loving plants like tomatoes. I always use them, highly recommend them. They're awesome. But I was finding that the critters were popping the tops off and they must have been reaching down in there and drinking out of them. So that's when I started putting the bowls out and that's when I started to notice less damage. So I hope that this is helpful. If you found this helpful, we would appreciate your subscribing to the channel. Leave me a little comment as well. That actually helps more people see this video. So if you like our content, if you could comment, that'd be great. If you don't like it, well, let me know what I can do differently next time. Maybe we'll record a video just for you to talk about your gardening issues. Hope you're having a great day. Garden properly and take care.